Merry Christmas. Can you feel it in the air? Well, admittedly, it uh, may be a little bit more difficult to feel Christmas this year in light of the election controversy and in light of the uh, COVID-19 resurgence and the fear that goes along with all of that. But let me tell you something. Christmas, the very first one, a little over 2,000 years ago, also had a lot of competition. A lot of it. At least from this world we live in. Not from a heavenly perspective, but from the world it certainly had a lot of competition. Bethlehem, where it took place, was anything but a peaceful little town. It was a stir, a veritable hub of activity, if you will. And I hate to be the one to break it to you, but old little town of Bethlehem was aghast with activity. Uh, the first stanza of that song that we're so familiar with at Christmas time proclaims, quote, how still we see thee lie. And that's not a reference to the town. That's a reference to our Lord, the baby Jesus, who amidst all of the hubbub of Caesar Augustus's census, Jesus entered the world quietly without fanfare. But his uh, quiet, obscure entrance would change the world, wouldn't it? No one knew it except Mary and Joseph and the shepherds um, who were told by the angel and the uh, host of angels that followed him. And at some time, maybe even not that night uh, specifically, but the Magi were also alerted to the fact that uh, ancient prophecy had indeed been fulfilled and a newborn king of the Jews had been born and they would find him eventually in Bethlehem. Yet the uh, ordinarily quiet and small town of Bethlehem was brimming that night and the inns were indeed full. Not a bed or an accommodation to be had. Why? Well, because even though the town of Bethlehem was small, especially in light of the capital city of Jerusalem that lied up the road uh, just five miles or so, Bethlehem was host to the relatives of the likes of these dignitaries and who's who's, who's who among the uh, Jewish VIP list. It had a lot of notoriety, Bethlehem did, in history down through the centuries. Consider Rachel. Uh, you remember her, Jacob's beloved wife. She was a patriarch of the Jewish faith. She died there in Bethlehem. I've actually seen her gravesite there when we had the good fortune of going to the Holy Land uh, a couple years ago. Also, Naomi, the mother-in-law of Ruth, of course, was from there. And, of course, Ruth, who followed Naomi back um, from Moab, uh, made her home there uh, as she married her Redeemer, Boaz, the picture of our Lord and Savior Jesus. All of these were in our Savior's bloodline and came or dwelt in uh, Bethlehem. And what about King David? He was born there. And just his prolific line in and of itself would have caused hundreds, if not thousands, to descend upon Bethlehem for that census. Because all men were required to return by order of Caesar to their ancestral roots to register. So we understand why there was no room at the inn Bethlehem may have never seen so much activity in so short a time, due, of course, to the mandated census. But God had something more important in mind than an old census for tax purposes for Caesar and the Roman government. Time had come for the Messiah's entrance into the world, his grand entrance, which actually would go largely unnoticed. God orchestrated the census to bring Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem for the census because you'll remember that uh, Mary and Joseph were both descendants of David and would be required to register there. 
And God had arranged for the birth of our Lord to be there to fulfill Micah's prophecy, written 700 years earlier. You'll find that over in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. God is great, isn't he? And um, the word coincidence is not in God's vocabulary. Of course it is, but he doesn't use it like that. Everything happens for a purpose, and God is in control. Uh, take that to the bank. Well, God does nothing by accident or happenstance. Uh, and let me give you a, uh, an example while we're chasing rabbits here. Do you know what the name of the town our Savior was born in means? Bethlehem. In Hebrew, Bethlehem means the house of bread. Now, isn't that apropos? Our Savior would be born in the house of bread, especially considering that Jesus would later proclaim as it's written over in John chapter 6, and particularly in verse 51, Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. What more fitting place than the house of bread for our Savior to be born? That's pretty cool, huh? I admit uh, that that kind of stuff just overwhelms me, and I didn't make it up. God did. And lest we forget, or not forget, uh, what the Apostle Paul told the Galatians, which we find in Galatians 4, 4, quote, When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons of God. You see, God had set in motion, even before he created the very first man, Adam, a plan to redeem us, mankind. He knew that Adam and Eve and would make a very poor choice in the garden and they would choose wrongly and they would choose to sin against him. He knew that before he ever made them. And in a failed attempt to become like God themselves, Adam and Eve were deceived by none other than Satan, and Jesus' coming was a fulfillment of that plan that God had set in motion way back, uh, which we can read about even in Genesis chapter 15, verse 3, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 15, which, by the way, is the very same chapter that we read of the fall. It didn't take God by surprise. He was ready. And um, Adam and Eve, he knew would sin, and the that they would break the relationship and the walk with God that would need to be restored. And as Galatians 4 said, when the fullness of time had come, God sent us Jesus. This was God's timetable when the exact religious, cultural, and political conditions came together 2,000 plus years ago. And we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. That's a, a fascinating history and study uh, of scripture about why that time was the one that God chose. It's easy for us to see now, but uh, I'm sure it was hard for them at that time. They'd been waiting so long. But that was when the our, our incarnate Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would come and invade our world to correct the course of history and restore us to a right relationship with our Maker. And by the way, to recalibrate our calendar, I always like to think of. You remember, we even number our years by the intersection of man and God back at that first Christmas, the coming together of God and man, the God-man, Jesus. And by the way, Bethlehem nor the world would ever be the same after that night, would it? Um, or would they? The first Christmas, 2,000 plus years ago, in Bethlehem is a benchmark. One writer even put it this way, quote, the hinge of history is on the door of a Bethlehem stable, end quote. Now that's just a phrase of speech and it, it's catchy in a writing because it probably isn't real accurate in the sense that um, 
I doubt that there was a stable that had a door on it. Uh, secular history tells us that the stable where Jesus was born was most likely in a cave uh, that probably didn't even have a door. But that's for debate. It's not necessarily spoken of. And so we've seen the nativity scene. As I've got three little ones back here. Uh, created a, a stable like we would think of. But uh, we'll find out someday. But metamorphically speaking, that statement was, it was the, the door opened that night to salvation, Bethlehem was. And even Jesus' name means what? Savior. He was and is Emmanuel, God with us. Well, last week we explored two questions. Number one, why did Jesus come to us as a baby? And number two, why was the virgin birth necessary? Or was it necessary? And you'll remember the answers to those very logical but super important questions, I might add, give us a bedrock understanding of how Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, saves us. Number one, he came to us as a baby as a sign of his humanity. Jesus was 100% human, a man. And number two, he came to us through a virgin birth as a sign of his deity, his divinity. He was also 100% God. Now, we don't have the capacity as finite creatures to understand that, but we will someday on the other side of our physical death. Jesus was and is truly the one and only God-man. That's proved not only by scripture, but by history in what he did and what he said and the fact that the tomb is empty. Well, today we dig a little deeper and explore, here it is, why was it that God had to come to us in the form of a man? Why did he have to come to us? Well, before we launch off into that, uh, let's have a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for Christmas um, that we celebrate each year, each and every year. It's a, it's a reminder and a celebration of the very first Christmas and what it was all about 2,000 plus years ago restoring us to a right relationship with you through your son and our savior, Jesus, who in reality and according uh, and in, a, in obedience to the plan that you had came to die for us. Jesus indeed was born to die, um, to die for our sins. Um, you gave yourself, gave up yourself, your son, and Jesus gave of himself, his life to save us. Uh, and praise God that uh, the same plan that you implemented indeed came to pass. And we thank you for that. And as we celebrate, and we thank you for the second half of that plan that we celebrate each Easter. As we celebrate the raising uh, from the dead and from the grave of our Savior Jesus. Father, we thank you for these truths. Uh, bless our time together now, O oh Lord. and. May your spirit guide me and speak to me and through me as we study your word and discuss these important things um, that we might hear the truth of your word. In Christ our Savior's name we pray these things. Amen. Well, um, you'll remember that we broke, uh, when we broke fellowship with the Lord, in the garden there, Adam and Eve, our relationship with him was severed. God is holy and righteous and just, and by his very nature cannot be present when sin is present. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short or fallen short of the glory of God. And then in Romans 6.23, we're given the verdict of our sin. Quote, For the wages of sin is what? Death. But uh, praise God for that comma that comes right after death because it says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Well, that, my friends, is what Christmas is really all about. John 3.16 played out um, literally. God so loved us, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting, eternal life. In verse 17, right after John 3, 16, which so often gets left out, but at Christmas time, certainly I believe needs to be included when we uh, think of John 3, 16. It says, quote, for God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but the wor that the world might be saved through him. That really is the Christmas story, isn't it? You see, God so loved us that he gave us his son to pay the penalty for our sin, to pardon us through his son, Jesus. And Jesus so loved us that we read over in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, quote, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake and mine, he became poor so that you and I, through his poverty, might become rich, end quote. And the rest of history, folks, is history. We pick up with our Lord Jesus as a baby in a lonely, dirty stable placed in a feed trough, a manger for you and me. Wow. Jesus chose the least so that you and I could have the most. He entered by the stable that you and I might dwell forever in the palace. So why did God send Jesus and why did Jesus agree to come? Well, <clears throat> we've touched on a lot of doctrine here, whether you realize it or not this morning. And there's a whole lot more that could be said about that. But that, to be honest with you, gets sorted out after you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Uh, he opens the scriptures to us and helps us understand what it is that salvation uh, it was it involved. And the Spirit reveals that to us through God's Word. But maybe the best way to bring this miracle of salvation into perspective is to borrow a story by one of my favorite men of all time, the late Paul Harvey, the great Christian conservative radio broadcaster for ABC Radio Networks of decades ago. Paul Harvey, as I said, who was a Christian, he died on February the 28th of 09 and went to be home with the Lord. But he first aired what I'm going to uh, read to you on Christmas Eve of 2004. Author is unknown. He adapted it to for his radio program. And he referred to it as a modern day parable. And we know what a parable is. We've looked at that. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. See what you think. One of my favorites. Now, the man to whom I'm going to introduce you was not a Scrooge. He was a kind, decent, mostly good man, generous to his family and upright in his dealings with other men. But he just did not believe in all that incarnation stuff, which the churches proclaim at Christmas time. It just did not make sense. And he was too honest to pretend otherwise. He could not swallow the Jesus story about God coming to earth as a man, he told his wife, I'm truly sorry to distress you, but I'm not going with you to church this Christmas Eve. He said he'd feel like a hypocrite, that he'd much rather just stay home, but that he would wait up for them. So he stayed and they went to the midnight service. Now, shortly after the family drove away in the car, snow began to fall. He went to the window to watch the flurries getting heavier and heavier. And he went back to his fireside chair and began to read his newspaper. Minutes later, he was startled by a thudding sound, then another, and then yet another. At first, he thought someone must be throwing snowballs against the living room window. But he went to the front door to investigate. He found a flock of birds huddled out there miserably in the snow. They had been caught in the storm. In a desperate search for shelter, they had tried to fly through his large landscape window. That's what was, had been making the sound. Well, he couldn't let the poor little creatures just lie there and freeze 
So he remembered the barn where his children stabled their pony. That would provide a warm shelter. All he would have to do is direct the birds into that shelter. Quickly, he put on a coat and galoshes and he tramped th through the deepening snow to the barn. And he opened the doors wide. And inside the barn, he turned on a light so the birds would know the way in. But the birds did not come in. So he figured that food would entice them. He went back into the house and fetched some breadcrumbs and sprinkled those on the snow, making a trail of breadcrumbs to the yellow lighted, wide open doorway to the stable. But to his dismay, the birds ignored the breadcrumbs. The birds just continued to flop around helplessly in the snow. He tried catching them. He could not. He tried shooing them into the barn by walking around them, waving his arms. But instead, they scattered in every direction, every direction except into the warm, lighted barn. And that's when he realized that they were afraid of him. They were afraid of him. To him, he reasoned, I'm a strange and terrifying creature. If only I could think of some way to let them know that they can trust me, that I'm not trying to hurt them, but to help them. But how? Any move he made tended to frighten them and confuse them. They just would not follow. They would not be led or shooed because they feared him. And he thought to himself, if only I could be a bird now and mingle with them and speak their language and tell them not to be afraid. Then I could show them the way to the safe, warm barn. But I would have to be one of them so they could see and hear and understand. At that moment, the church bells began to ring. The sound reached his ears above the sounds of the wind. And he stood there listening to the bells. Adeste Fidelis, listening to the bells, pealing the glad tidings of Christmas. And he sank to his knees in the snow. Rob Hudson for Paul Harvey and for our Lord God Almighty. I hope for you and those you love, this will be a wonderfully merry Christmas. I'll see you next week. Good day. Mm -hmm.